athlete. He was willing and to able to come. No. So no. we're honored to have him here. Is it broken? And no. Dylan, please welcome John Scalzo.
it went straight into the roast of herbs. You can imagine the roast that seems to have the power of nature to cleanse itself with such that Diana and I had marathon swimmers still spare around the hat ones before they were so extreme. Now there's treatment, thanks to God. And now I and I swim across the river to point out that it's clean enough. And government required those cabinet converters to put on cars. They don't pull those much. And they work so well that every time somebody buys a new car, it jumps an old one, the air gets cleaner. But now it's gotten to be like a religious movement, this environmental movement. And we're getting a very diminishing returns that cost a huge amount of money. And a lot of the rules being passed now, I think, just screw poor people who can't afford to pay the extra $200 for the extra ounce of pollution squeezed out of the car uh, and do very little extra good for the environment. And I think that applies to global warming, too. It's carbon dioxide. That's what we exhale. It's what plants breathe. We don't know for sure that that's pollution. And to turn people's lives upside down with that theory seems extreme. Well, other questions, or uh, you. You also have to question. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I I was I was at the comic center last night when you spoke, and um, with the complete free trade and everything that you support, what do you say to the the small farmer or the assembly line worker that loses their job to a worker overseas that can do it for less money? If you have complete free trade, what do you say to the guy who loses his job because somebody overseas does it for less money? I say, I'm sorry, but too bad. That's life. Uh, it seems rough, but that's how it works for most people in America. There are a thousand restaurants that go out of business every week. Farmers, though, feel they're special. And they need government support because they shouldn't go out of business. Well, I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's unfair. That's discrimination. The creative destruction that's made us wealthy in America, capitalism has really created destruction, it has to allow some people to lose their jobs. And if somebody in India can do my job cheaper than I can, then I will lose my job. But it's that freedom to go to India, to go offshore, that creates more jobs in America. And studies have shown that companies that outsource the most are also the companies that hire the most people in there. Because the money they save on hiring those specialist Indian engineers make them more efficient here and they grow more. And countries with free trade like America are the ones that have the lowest unemployment. So yes, it's very tough. The, the seeing part is the loss. You can see the guy who loses his job. But you don't see the three people who gain a job because of free trade. So you're not sure who they are. And the media doesn't take their picture. So I say I'm sorry to that person, but he's lucky he lives in a vibrant country that will give him a chance to find a new job. And frankly, if his old job wasn't making a profit for his company, he was going to go away and eventually get it. And this was 
good, dramatic, gotcha television. We put that on TV in Portland, Oregon, and then the politicians would call up and say, hey, that was great. That's terrible what you exposed. We're going to fix that. We're going to pass a law. We're going to create the Department of Consumer Affairs. And we're going to license all repairmen, TV repairmen, car repairmen. And young John Stossel was so thrilled by the report that the politicians are calling me, they're passing a law, and they're going to fix this problem. But then five years later, I saw that they didn't do anything. They now had a big bureaucracy, the Department of Consumer Affairs. But the bureaucrats, they didn't do tests like I had. They just sat in their office and had new TV repair companies that knew about the law fill out forms. And then, then they had to hire lawyers. And they had to pay more for everything. And that raised the price of TV repairs. repairs. And maybe the immigrant business that didn't even know about the law or couldn't afford a lawyer, they had to go work illegally. And then they're under pressure of a cop coming in and saying, oh, I'm going to report you on this TV and free TV repairs for maybe 100 bucks. And it created all these complications. But the cheaters, some cheaters still cheated. And most people did. And I soon saw that word about that gets out. It's even better now with the internet. But if you're a company that cheats people, people find out. And if you're a company that serves your customers really well, people find that out. And that's the way to get rich in America. Companies that serve people really well get more customers, and Walmart, Microsoft, that's what's made billionaires, not cheap people. Anybody else have a question? What do you think, I mean, this, this world you went through, what do you think the challenges for American students are today when it comes to economic issues? Certainly, economic education is the first step, but the one thing that, in my perspective, is it's true that it, the American system, frankly, the kids your age don't do very well in the international competitions. I did a test, uh, one of the international tests we gave kids in New Jersey the same test we gave to kids in Belgium, the Belgian kids were way ahead. And yet, Americans are winning the Nobel Prizes and building the biggest companies and making the best medical inventions. And I would say it's our college system because you really have free competition on the college level. Maybe a government monopoly at this level and you're lucky to live in a good neighborhood and have a good school. Um, you know, I just don't have a good answer. I'm trying to educate people about this. It's comfortable to think that competition is sort of nasty. We should have mommy. We want our mommies and daddies to take care of us when we're little. And when we're older, we think of government that way. But government isn't a mommy or daddy. Government is a clumsy instrument. If we turn to them for solutions, we give up our freedom and our opportunity. And Thomas Jefferson said it's the natural progress of things for government to gain liberty to heal. And that is what tends to happen. Are you looking at the question? Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the most basic premises of democracy is of inherent trust that government is workable and protects the interests of the people. Yet libertarianism, a party which exists under the umbrella of democracy, seems to run counter to that. How do you do that? And, and what, what do you mean it runs counter to that? That's true. Um, I, I don't think that's a contradiction. I think that's what the founders had in mind when they wrote the Bill of Rights. They said, we distrust trust government. Governments have all this grown. They have all this got power in it. And so we want to have these checks and analysis. That's why I the legislature as a check on the president of the Supreme Court as a check on the legislature. <laughs> Libertarians say, we ought to keep it that small. The Libertarian Party is ridiculous and tiny and has a bunch of fruitcakes running for office. <laughs> America traditionally has been called a two-party country, and so the Libertarians have never gotten a foothold. But I think the founders have my right idea, and suspicion of government is healthy. We need government, but only two ways to do things in life, voluntary or forced. Voluntary is the best. It's how you pick up friends and 
economies, mostly do. Government is force. And we need some force. We need government to keep us safe. We need these pollution rules. But the best of life is not the third part. I was not even answering your question, but it's the best I can do. Parker, uh, prostitution. How can I support the legalization of prostitution when sometimes it's not the woman's fault that she can't hold out another job and she has no other choice? Right? Summarizing your question correctly. Um, this comes out of my argument that once you're an adult, you own your body. And uh, if a boxer could rent his body out and risk his safety or a football player, why can't a woman rent her body out for sex? Why is it her choice? I'm not saying it's a good thing. I think it's a terrible thing. I'm just saying that the law is against it driving underground and making it worse. And she's saying, how can I support this? And many people say this. When the woman is basically is not a free will, she has no other choice. And to that I say, bunk. We have free will. All of us have free will. And maybe if she was enslaved, that's terrible. That should be illegal. Nobody should be forced prostitution or forced labor of any kind. But that woman had no choice. She could clean toilets. She could work at Walmart. If you look at the one end of the paper, there is a constant list of people looking for jobs. She's making a bad choice, but it's her choice. And I would argue as an adult, she has the right to make that choice. Yes? Uh, last night, you were posed with a question about uh, the oil market. Some lady asked you, do you think it failed? And I thought that your answer was just really insightful, and I was wondering if you could give the same discussion to us here about whether or not the oil market has failed uh, the United States. Uh, has the oil market failed the United States? And I would say not. And I think you hear all this whining in the media. Oil prices are so high, it's so terrible, and they're so greedy. They're making so much money, and it's true. Uh, Exxon only made $40 billion in profit. But I say, as usual, the press gets it entirely wrong. Let's think about gasoline, which costs four dollars a gallon. A third of that price is government, by the way, it comes to taxes, so it really only costs about two fifty a gallon. And for that two fifty a gallon, they have to go to horrible places where there are wars, where people are shooting at them often, or into the Arctic where the temperatures are way below freezing, and they drill a hole seven miles deep into the earth. The drills now even bend as they go to look for the oil. They suck it out of the ground, they put it in pipelines to go across oceans. They have to refine it into three different types of gasoline. They put, put it in trucks that cost $100,000 each. They ship it to all those gas stations where they have to have all this expensive equipment so we don't blow ourselves up. And it still costs less than the bottled water they sell at the gas station. In 250 gallon, that's cheap. It's a miracle of capitalism that they bring it to us for that little money. But people don't get that and they see the big signs and uh, people are more price conscious about gasoline. And as far as the oil company profits, people complain about them and the oil companies cringe. What I wish some oil company executive would do is say, what are you complaining about the profits for? You should want us to make more profits. Profit is what makes opportunity grow in America. What do you think we do with the profits? Buy fancy cars? Well, we do actually. But that's only a tiny percentage of the money that we keep for ourselves. 99% goes to drilling for more oil or looking for alternative energy technologies. You should want us to make more profit on us. Yes? And I'm just going to interrupt you here. Just a general public speaking tip, because I cannot hear her well with this noise here. If you breathe from your stomach, and it comes out much louder that way. So, but stand up. Start again. Okay. Given that I'm saying that the government fails without one vote for prostitution or some
so many moral questions. Wouldn't that, isn't that a harmful moral message? Doesn't that encourage people to behave in immoral ways? I don't think so. I can see how people believe that, that, that by banning these things, it says our country believes with force of law that these things are so bad they must be illegal. But does that help people make moral choices? I think you have to have free will to make a moral choice. If you choose not to become a prostitute, if you choose not to take harmful drugs, then you're making a moral choice. Right now you have government saying these drugs are forbidden. But the law isn't working. It's, as you know, there stuff's available, right? We can't even keep it out of prisons. I don't know how we think we're going to keep it out of America. So I think cruelty is a terrible thing. But we don't try to make that illegal. That's why I think the founders were right. The government force should be limited to protecting our people and property from direct injury by others. And when it strays into the land of morals, it goes awry. Yeah. Uh, what are your feelings? <laughs> I'm right here. Um, what are your feelings on the um, the economy day with the recession and uh, the uh, election? I know a recession is part of the natural business cycle, but how do you think feel it's going to work into the election, and what do you think they're going to do about it? Uh, why don't we have the last one because I have to go catch a plane. Um, I'm really glad to say you think the recession is part of the natural business cycle. I am too. In that, but the press is to be talking about the mortgage crisis and the credit crisis. The press always does this. Maybe the killer bees were going to come up and kill us instead of that. Bird flu is going to kill everybody. The press is always screaming crisis. And uh, it's true, mortgage defaults are up. They're up to something like 2% of all mortgages, but that means 98% of people are paying their mortgages. We're not, we have 5% unemployment not the 25% we had during the Depression. The interest rates were at 18% during the Carter administration. I mean, this is not a crisis. It might become one, but we shouldn't talk it into a crisis. And I agree, this probably is going to be close to a recession, and some people are going to be hurting, and that will help the opposition party, in this case the Democrats, in the election. Not that they need help after uh, the last eight years, turned against Republicans, and many more people self-identify as Democrats. As far as the direct effect, um, I would say that all the pundits on TV don't know squat. They all study it and they guess, but their opinions are not very valuable. I think the most valuable opinion when it comes to politics is the wisdom of crowds. Uh, it's the same thing if you watch The Millionaire the Show, ask the audience, it's amazing how often the audience gets it right, much more than when they call a friend or when the friend is an expert. Because there are idiots in crowds, but the majority often is right. And if you combine this wisdom of crowds to people betting their own money, then you get real wisdom. And there is that in the political world now. There are stock markets where people bet on things like who's going to win the Oscars, or will there be a recession, or who will get the nomination. And because gambling is illegal in America, these sites are based overseas. The best is called Intrade. You can find it at Intrade.com. And you can bet on the election. And right now, if you want to bet that Hillary will get the nomination, you can buy Hillary for 18 cents to win a dollar. And they have to pay 80 cents to buy a bottle. But in terms of effect on the presidential election, one piece of humility I learned in studying liberty is that no one individual can have any clue what this whole country of 300 million people is thinking. But if you get to, to crowds betting, you get closer to 